ඔෆිස් එකේ දී විතරක් නෙවෙයි මම දැන් ගෙදරදිත් IDD කෝස් ගන්න SLT ෆෝන් එකේ ඔබේ නිවසේ SLT දුරකථනය දැන් IDD පහසුකම සහිතයි Good evening tonight to the yonder he goes Final rites for an iconic Sri Lankan director Dr Lester James Peary is held with state patronage attended by thousands gift so much to the society he lived in and then making it enriched and leave behind an example as the cabinet grows 18 state and deputy ministers take oath before the president as a second stage of the cabinet reshuffle got underway today don't rock the boat central bank calls the government to create political stability in order to achieve sustained growth and development in the economy back in business the much debated glyphosate ban lifted under a directive from the minister of plantation japan has detected levels that are not in conformity with the market and they have warned us they will take action and subpoena to the chief robert muller eyes to question president trump in his russia investigation It's nine o'clock on the dot. This is first at nine on Sri Lanka's news channel. Other than at twenty-four-seven. Hello, everyone. I'm Mahesh Jani. A Sri Lankan cinema legend says farewell to the world. We'll have a full report of the final rides of Dr. Lester James Pearis. That's coming up later on in the show. But first, we begin with the cabinet reshuffle. Following the reappointment of 18 cabinet of ministers yesterday it was the turn of state and deputy ministers today to undergo the reappointment process accordingly eight state ministers and 10 deputy ministers were sworn in before president maithripala sirisena at the presidential secretariat during today's proceedings parliamentarians veer kumar disanayaka and said ali sahir maulana received their maiden state and deputy ministerial portfolios With President Maithripala Sirisena reappointing 18 cabinet ministers yesterday, the Presidential Secretariat played host to the reappointment proceedings for 18 state and deputy ministers today. Eight state ministers and 10 deputy ministers took oath before the president while some netting their maiden state and deputy ministerial positions. Palitha Rangibandara saw the portfolio of disaster management added to his responsibilities and took oath as the State Minister of Irrigation, Water Resources and Disaster Management. State Minister Dilip Vedarachi also retained his portfolio of fisheries and aquatic resources development with the addition of rural economic affairs. State Minister MLA M Hisbullah was sworn in as State Minister of Highways and Road Development. Earlier he was the Minister of Rehabilitation and Resettlement. State Minister Mohan Lal Grero was given the additional portfolio of cultural affairs to go with his state ministerial position of higher education. State Minister Champika Premadasa who held the state ministerial portfolio of industry and commerce took oath as the state minister of plantation industries State Minister of Science Technology and Research Lakshman Senaviratna now have more responsibilities as portfolios of skills development vocational training and hill country heritage are brought under him State Minister Shriyani Vijay Vikrama retained her portfolio of provincial councils and local authorities with sports also brought under her purview Veera Kumara Disanayake who represented the joint opposition and later joined the SLFP was given his first state ministerial position within the national government he was sworn in as the state minister of mahavali development a portfolio previously held by minister mahinda amaravira with the reappointment of eight state ministers it was the turn of 10 deputy ministers to take oath before the president Amir Ali Shehabdin continues to be the deputy minister of rural economic affairs with fisheries and aquatic resources development also added to his portfolio as he took oath today. Dunesh Gangkanda was sworn in as the deputy minister of lands and parliamentary reforms. He was the previous deputy minister of disaster management. Ranjan Ramanayake who was hopeful of a cabinet ministerial position yet again had to be content with a deputy ministerial portfolio. He lost out on portfolios of social welfare and hill country heritage as he took oath as the deputy minister of social empowerment. Deputy Minister of Skills Development and Vocational Training Karuna Ratna Parnavitana retained his position with the subjects of science, technology and research as well as hill country heritage also vested on him. 
Sarathi Dushmanta continues to be the Deputy Minister of Justice with prison reforms added to his responsibilities in place of Buddha Sasana. Palita Thevara Peruma was sworn in today as the Deputy Minister of Sustainable Development, Wildlife and Regional Development. He previously served as the Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs, Wyamba Development and Cultural Affairs. Manushanana Kara, who held the Deputy Ministerial position of Foreign Employment, was given the additional responsibility of being the Deputy Minister of Telecommunication, Digital Infrastructure and Foreign Employment. Deputy Minister of Primary Industries Muthu Sivalingam today took oath as the Deputy Minister of Social Welfare in addition to his existing portfolio. Parliamentarian Zaid Ali Zahir Maulana took oath today as the Deputy Minister of National Integration, Reconciliation and Official Languages. This is his maiden Deputy Ministerial position. HMM Haris was sworn in as the Deputy Minister of Public Enterprise and Candy Development, a change from sports. With today's reappointments, the National Unity Government now consists of 80 ministers, inclusive of the President and the Prime Minister. 42 of them comprise the Cabinet, while 20 are State Ministers, with 18 Deputy Ministers completing the pack. We want to bring you some other local stories we have for you tonight. Many politicians express their views over the reappointment of Cabinet Ministers today. Let's take a look. Scientific basis of allocating ministries has not been adhered to properly. Because you see a lot of uh, unwanted ministries among all together. So about Mr. Vijay Dasar taking over a cabinet portfolio, I am very happy that the subject of cultural affairs was taken away from Mr. Akhilaviraj Kharivasam and given to Mr. Rajapaksa because we, I think uh, Mr. Rajapaksa is uh, good enough to handle the Ministry of Culture Affairs together with the Ministry of Higher Education. The backbenchers are unhappy. There are more than 20 backbenchers who have decided not to participate in anything that the Prime Minister calls for. I don't mind if I'm taken off my duty since we have to win an election next time. There will be no one to protect us and we are answerable to the public. And I think it's time for many of them to go home. 20 backbenchers of the UNP are objecting to the Prime Minister retaining his leadership position in the UNP. Clearly, there is an explosion in the government and the UNP. Cabinet has been amended four times within three years. Ministerial portfolios have been given to satisfy people who were angry and in some cases to take revenge. There is no scientific basis to it at all. Newly appointed Minister of Higher Education and Cultural Affairs, Dr. Vijayadasa Rajapaksa, puts the blame on the government for the country's university system being dysfunctional owing to the CITEM issue. Assuming duties at the ministry today, he expressed hope of bringing the matter to a resolution very soon. CITEM Prasne. The university system was dysfunctional for about a year due to the CITEM issue. We as a government should be held responsible over it. This university, which was built without proper standards during the previous government, rendered the entire university system in the country dysfunctional. Our responsibility is to bring things back to normalcy by providing solutions. I don't say that the previous ministers did not do their job properly, but what I say is that adequate action was not taken. The Prime Minister and the President, who removed me from my position, have reappointed me as a minister. The incoming minister also responded to questions raised by journalists. The context of the government has now changed. I accepted the post as the President and the Prime Minister made a request. As politicians, we should be able to help the public whenever possible. The iconic film director and producer Dr. Lester James Spiris today made his final farewell to the nation and to the mortal realm. Thousands, including the President, the Prime Minister and other political leaders as well as artists, gathered to pay their last respects to the late stalwart of Sri Lankan cinema at the Independence Square today. Dr. Lester James Pierce, renowned as the father of Sri Lankan cinema, revolutionized the then Sri Lankan film industry, which was influenced by South Indian cinema. He flavored it with the Western filmmaking and his own inspirations, gathered through his travel to England in 1947, where Dr. Pierce first began pursuing his passion for cinema. 
It was after his successful assignment in England that he returned to Ceylon in 1952 and created the landmark film Ray Carver. His uniqueness in filmmaking was recognized not just locally but also globally when Ray Carver was nominated for the Palme d'Or in 1957, the highest accolade awarded at the Cannes Film Festival. It was the first time a Sri Lankan film was chosen for an international accolade. Dr. Pierce's journey in filmmaking gave him the opportunity to be involved in over 28 films, which included short films and documentaries. The veteran is highly respected for his movies Vaikande Valawa, Gam Peralia, Dilawa Katara, Ran Salu, Golu Hadavata, Madol Duva, Nidhanaya and Yugantaya. His film Nidhanaya is hailed as the best Sri Lankan film so far and was the only Sri Lankan film to be included in the top 100 movies of the world. His film Vaikande Valawa starring Ravindra Randeniya and Malini Fonseca was Sri Lanka's first ever submission for the Academy Awards. Undoubtedly, all the films which he have edited, all the films which he have produced are the best in Sri Lanka in artistic way and also in the commercial way. The late veteran director's contributions to cinema earned him several local and international awards, including the title Sri Lanka Bimanya, the highest honour for a civilian in Sri Lanka. His exceptional creativity along with his leadership skills inspired a few generations of younger filmmakers to try their best in the industry. Lester James Perez, um, I regard him as, as my teacher in the cinema. To gather the knowledge and the experience before you act or before you become a creator, appreciator of the field. So that is first uh, the lesson he taught us. Dr. Lester James Pierce passed away on Sunday at the age of 99 while receiving treatment at a private hospital in Colombo. Since Monday, throngs including politicians and artists came to his residence along the Lester James Pierce Mavata in Colombo 5 to pay their final respects. In recognition of the utmost service Dr. Pierce rendered to the nation, today is declared a national day of mourning. Catholic religious proceedings were conducted this morning before his body was taken to the Independence Square so that the people will be given the final chance to pay their last respects to the late epoch-defining film director. The funeral cortege paused a while at the National Film Corporation, where artists joined the cortege in honour of the late Dr. Pires. Once taken to the Independent Square, late Dr. Pires's body was laid on a special platform and the funeral proceedings commenced at 3 p.m. He directed some work in order to bring the ability of audience to appreciate high level quality of cinemas. He brought name of Singhali cinema to other countries. Bringing international honour and recognition to Mother Lanka as no other filmmaker has ever done, showered with accolades, fame and distinction in every film forum and festival as one of the most distinguished filmmakers of the world, you were never afflicted by false arrogance. That is why I make this profound statement that we will not get another Lester James Pierce here again. For me, you know, Pierce was a, almost a father figure. His essential nature of humor, simplicity, and the concern for the others endeared him to everyone who came across in his life. You know, even the last time when I met him in his house, his mind was very sharp, and uh, he had a remarkable memory of the past and a great attention to detail of the present. Gift so much to the society he lived in and then making it enriched and leave behind an example. He's not only an icon of the Senegal cinema, he's one of the great filmmakers of the world. President and Prime Minister, the home of Dr. Lester James Pires was his sanctuary. It was there that Sri Lankan cinema was groomed. It will only be the two of you who have the power to make this sanctuary a cinema museum. The next hope of thousands of film fans is to see Mrs. Pires living in that house for the rest of her life. Our next hope is to see that she be provided the monthly government allowance for the rest of her life as well. 
Sunil Ari Ratna made a proposal. We as the government will take measures to make his request a reality. May Dr. Pires attain Nibbana and may he be blessed. Following the independence, the two most influential people in shaping Sri Lankan literature, in my opinion, is Edirivira Sarachandra and Dr. Lester James Pires. It was their effect that we saw during 1960s. May Dr. Lester James Pires attain Nibbana. Following the religious proceedings, late Dr. Lester James Pierce's remains were placed inside the special funeral pyre, which was a replica of the fort, which featured in Dr. Pierce's film Sunday Shear. The funeral pyre of the iconic film director and producer late Dr. Lester James Pierce was then lit. As the sun was setting for the day, so did the era of the veteran film director, one which late Dr. Pierce inspired with greatness, honour and example. The father of Sri Lankan cinema set off on his final journey, reducing thousands to tears. Now, the prestigious Indian award given to acclaimed Sri Lankan director, late Dr. Lester James Pires, was reported missing at his funeral. The Golden Peacock Award received by the late veteran was found missing from his residence this afternoon. He was honored with this award in 1965. The Golden Peacock Award was displayed by his coffin. A family member said that they noticed the award has disappeared as the coffin was removed from his home to the Independence Square for the the cremation ceremony. An investigation is currently underway. Let's move on to other local stories we have for you tonight. The Department of Meteorology has issued a heat advisory to northern, north central, eastern, Uber and northwestern provinces, as well as Mathale and Hambatura districts. The advisory states that the heat level can go up to the level of extreme caution, which may lead to heat strokes in some areas of the Polunarwa district. Some parts of the country have been experiencing soaring temperatures of late. As a result, the Department of Meteorology today moved to caution the public by issuing a heat advisory covering certain provinces and districts. High temperature during the March to May is not unusual, but we started to issue a warning. However, the temperature, I mean, that high temperature combined with the high relativity, we feel an uncomfortable situation. That is what we call index. The caution level is expected in most parts of northern, north, central and eastern provinces. The caution level can also be expected in some parts of the north, western and over provinces and Mathale and Hambantura district tomorrow. In isolated places in the Polonaru district, the level can go up to extreme caution level as well. The heat index forecast is calculated by using relative humidity and maximum temperature and this is the condition that is felt on your body. When the heat index is between levels of 27 to 38, it's considered normal. When the index is between 39 to 45, it's considered as caution, which can cause fatigue with prolonged exposure and activity and heat cramps as well. The level between 46 to 52 is considered as extreme caution as it can cause heat cramps and possible heat exhaustion. Levels over 52 is considered as danger as heat cramps and heat strokes are possible. The Department of Meteorology urges the public to stay hydrated and limit serenous outdoor activities. In one of our headline stories, Minister of Plantation Industries Navin Desanayake reveals that the ban which was imposed on the herbicide glyphosate is lifted for tea and rubber industries with effect from today. The minister made the revelation at a media briefing held in Colombo today. The University of California found that the herbicide glyphosate is a main factor leading to kidney diseases within several areas in Sri Lanka, following which pressure was mounted on the government to ban the herbicide. It was in this backdrop that the government completely banned imports of glyphosate-related products on the 23rd of October in 2015 through a Gazette notification. Sri Lanka became the first country in the world to take such a measure. 
However, following the ban, parties related to the tea industry made complaints that they were facing negative effects due to the ban. As a result, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Management appointed a special committee to review the policy on weedicides and pesticides. In the latest development of the matter, Minister of Plantation Industries Navin Desanayake today announced that the ban on herbicide glyphosate is lifted for tea and rubber products with effect from today. As some tea producers have used the weedicide uh, MCPA instead of glyphosate, Japan has detected levels that are not in conformity with their market, with their accepted levels, and they have actually warned us they will take action in terms of a ban if this continues. <laughs> No, and there is no, we have... And he says that there is a... Uh, no. No. No, there is no evidence like that. That's Channa Jaisumana, no? Hypothesis. It's not a, there is no scientific basis of his paper. However, the decision to lift the ban is heavily criticised by parties who stood for the policy. It is pathetic to notice that the Sri Lankan government has decided to lift the ban on glyphosate while it is being identified as a group 2A carcinogen, a nephrotoxin and an endocrine disruptive chemical. It is obvious and it has been proven beyond doubt glyphosate is linked to chronic kidney disease epidemic in Sri Lanka as well as high cancer incidence. As researchers who have engaged in research on glyphosate and non-communicable diseases, it is unbelievable. The cabinet itself appointed a committee to look into the matter. It was in this backdrop that they lifted the ban for tea and rubber. This is an illegal act done without the public's knowledge and this is an unethical decision. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Welcome back. Let's move on to business stories we have for you tonight. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka today called for political stability in order to sustain economic growth a week after reporting that the country's growth slid to 3.1% last year, the slowest in 16 years. Central Bank, however, said that the recent foreign sentiment signals confidence in Sri Lanka's economic performance and potential. Now, issuing a statement today, the regulator insisted that the government should forge ahead with sound macroeconomic policies bringing about fiscal consolidation, prudent monetary policies and a flexible exchange rate that would support the competitiveness of the economy. The central bank issued a statement today in response to serious concerns expressed in recent days regarding the performance of the Sri Lankan economy. In this context, the regulator said it is instructive to gauge the level of external support for the Sri Lankan economy from international capital markets and this would be an independent barometer of the health of the Sri Lankan economy as international capital markets are hard-nosed in their assessments. Noting the successful issue of a 2.5 billion US dollar international sovereign bond, the CBSL says orders were attracted by some of the world's largest and most reputed investment funds. And with the receipt of those proceeds, gross official reserves increased to a historical high of 9.9 .9 billion US dollars. However, the regulator warned that the government must press ahead with its reform agenda to retain foreign investor confidence. While adding that there have been foreign portfolio investments in equity, through primary and secondary market investment in the Colombo Stock Exchange, foreign direct inflows amounted to 1.9 billion US dollars in 2017 reflecting positive sentiment of the performance of the Sri Lankan economy. The statement adds that it is imperative to build upon this positiveness by persisting with sound macroeconomic policies and accelerate structural reforms to strengthen factor markets in order to improve investment climate, boost investment promotion, introduce trade facilitation measures and also complete trade negotiations. The central bank concluded the statement warning that political stability is essential for sustained growth and development in the country. Well, the Colombo bores a close negative, while as a result of price losses in counters such as TJ Lanka, overseas reality and distilleries with turnover crossing 612 million rupees. Furthermore, foreign closed as net sellers, mainly due to foreign selling in TJ Lanka. Now, let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies during the day today.
Former Director of Military Intelligence and Chief of Staff of the Army, retired Major General Amar Karuna Sekhar, was further remanded until the 16th of May by the Mount Lavinia Magistrates Court. He was arrested by the CID on the 6th of April this year in connection with the abduction and assault of journalist Keith Neuer in 2008. With that, let's take a look at other stories making headlines across Sri Lanka. The Special International Buddhist Conference of Rajagiriya Sadham Sevana International Buddhist Centre was inaugurated by President Maitripala Sirisena today. The four-day conference is attended by Buddhist clergy representing Thailand, China, Japan, Myanmar, Vietnam and Nepal together with the Buddhist leaders and heads of Buddhist organisations from various countries. A wildfire which broke out in the Thadduan Forest Reserve in Mullaitivu was extinguished by army personnel of the 64th Division. The fire was doused using browsers over a period of an hour and the villagers claimed that had the fire spread, it would have destroyed many neighbouring villages. Three suspects were arrested by the Talavakale police for possession and sale of Kerala cannabis. The suspects had packed 300 grams of cannabis into 40 small packets when the arrest was made. The police says that the suspects are residents of Talavakale and they will be produced before the Nuwarelia Magistrates Court tomorrow. You are watching Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. On to international news now, U.S. media reports that Special Counsel Robert Mueller warned that he could order President Donald Trump to testify as part of a probe into alleged Russian election meddling. Mueller suggested the move during talks with Trump's lawyers in March. A threat to issue a subpoena, as it is known, was reportedly met with a sharp response from one of Trump's former lawyers. It is believed to be the first time that Special Counsel Robert Mueller has raised the possibility of U.S. President Donald Trump testifying as a part of a probe into alleged Russian election meddling. The Washington Post reports that Trump's lawyers insisted during a meeting in March that the president was under no obligation to face questions by federal investigators in relation to the Russia inquiry. However, Mueller's team reportedly responded by suggesting they would issue a subpoena if Trump declined. They agreed to provide the president's lawyers with more specific information about the questions they wish to ask Trump. The president's former lawyer, John Dowd, has also said that Mueller mentioned the possibility of forcing Trump to face questions. Dowd, who resigned about a week and a half after the meeting, said he told investigators that the probe was not some game. Now here's a look at some emerging stories from across the world. The World Health Organization said yesterday that air pollution still kills 7 million people each year, almost all of them in poor countries in Asia and Africa, and that 9 out of 10 people on the planet breathe in polluted air, following the release of its latest data on air pollution worldwide. According to the health institution, about a quarter of deaths from heart disease, stroke and lung cancer can be attributed to air pollution. Over 100 people are still in custody today after violence on the margins of Paris's traditional May Day march, which saw a fast food restaurant ransacked and clashes between police and protesters. Almost 300 people were arrested during the protest and 109 were still being held by police, while authorities said some 1,200 protesters from anarchist group, the Black Blocs, were involved, many of them masked and dressed in black. Six artificially bred Chinese alligators or Yangtze alligators will be released to their natural habitat after their dormancy in the Yangtze Alligator Reserve in Xuancheng City of East China's Anhui Province. Only found in China, the Yangtze alligator is one of the most endangered species among the 23 alligator species in the world. You are watching. Sri Lanka's number one news channel, other than 24 7. Time now to take a look at the weather. Light showers are expected in the areas of the western, Sabragamur central and northwestern provinces, while fairly heavy falls can be expected in southern and Uwa provinces. With that, let's now take a look at your city by city forecast.
And that is a part of your world tonight right here on Other Than 24 7, Sri Lanka's news channel. I'm Mahesh Johnny. First at 9, we'll return tomorrow at the same time. Be sure to join us then. But before we wrap things up for tonight, we would like to bring you how Colombo is still in the festive spirit even after the official conclusion of Wesak Poe Day celebrations. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good night. The news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Varana 24-7.